Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where I get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today my guest is Robin Witten, founder and editor of Audiophile Magazine, which is my go-to guide for everything audiobooks. Robin chose a book that is not only great in print, but absolutely masterful on audio, and we do discuss the difference. Join me today as I chat with Robin about the beautifully produced children's fantasy classic, The Golden Compass, by Philip Pullman. Hi, Robin. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Nice to be here, Julie. My listeners know how I feel about audiobooks. I'm rather passionate, rather opinionated about them. (laughs) And now that I have you here, we can do a deep dive. So I want to start, before we get to what you do now, I want to start with your reading life in general, how you became a reader and what your reading life was when you were a kid. Well, let's see. I was a reader as a kid. Uh, and, uh, you know, all through, uh, college, I was a reader and then maybe as life got a little busier, uh, less reading, uh, until I started, um, with, uh, some work that had me traveling a great deal, uh, in the car in, um, late 1960s. Uh, actually maybe a little, no, I must've been a little later than that in the 1970s. So, um, and I wasn't getting any reading done. I was working and, uh, driving around, uh, and a friend suggested that I try an audiobook. and she had been a traveling sales person. And she said, this is the only thing there's no, we're in Maine, there's no radio reception and anyway, and audiobooks are so great. So I went to the library and I took out my very first audiobook, which was a John Le Carre uh, mystery uh, called The Call for the Dead. I remember exactly. And <laughs> my life changed from that moment on. Um, I listened to audiobooks. Uh, I was fascinated uh, by the form, by the creative performance side of audiobooks, um, how the, ex- the listening experience changed how I perceived uh, the story. Um, and, you know, uh, here we are, 30 some years later, <laughs> listening to audiobooks and talking about audiobooks. Um, and the industry, of course, has exploded since then. Now, you do a lot more than listen and talk about audiobooks. Tell me how you parlayed that, your love of audiobooks into a career. So then as a, as a reader turning into a listener, I was fascinated about it. And uh, I talked to the director of our public library, who was also a listener. And he was telling me about how the libraries couldn't, uh, our library couldn't keep audiobooks on their shelves. And so, you know, they were just there was so much demand that the audiobooks were just flying off the shelves. And so we talked about um, how the idea of um, an audiobook being a performance and that some performances were better than others, that that was something that should be, could be reviewed the way a music or a concert or films are reviewed. And so he let me know that at that time, Libraries were acquiring a lot of audiobooks, but they were not doing any, uh, re- there were no reviews that had to do specifically with the audiobook. So they were just basing acquisitions on the reviews of the printed book. And I said, he and I agreed, this is not the same thing. You know, there is so much creative uh, performance and uh you know, experience that goes into an audiobook, they should be reviewed as performances. And so we chatted and, and this was the days of Dex desktop publishing and newsletters that you could write yourself. So I said, well, Sheldon, I'll just do a, uh, I'll do a little newsletter on audiobooks. Would that be fun? He said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And we can send it around to libraries. And anyway, that's how it started. And in 1992, in June, 
uh, I published my first newsletter, audio file, um, which reviewed 25 audiobooks. <laughs> that you had listened to, all of them that you had listened yeah. to, and then you reviewed them for performance quality. Yes. And, you know, obviously, why would you listen? Or if you didn't want to listen to, I mean, why you shouldn't listen to them? Uh, you know, both, they weren't all positive reviews, mostly positive reviews, but that's how it started. And then I uh, started being, because it was, we thought it would be a library publication, that there should be more people than just one listener. So uh, I started talking uh, among other librarians and people that I ran into were interested in audiobooks and recruiting people to other reviewers. So along the model of professional reviewing, the way it's done for library journals and, and uh, publications, that's where Audiophile started. Um, and it hasn't changed all that much and just gotten a lot bigger and more <laughs> formats of audiobooks have changed because this was all cassettes. Yes, I remember those. <laughs> uh, and then CDs coming in, um, and then uh, MP3 CDs, and now digital downloads almost exclusively for audiobooks. But there's been so many changes, but we're still, you know, that's what I listen to is for the performance of an audiobook, what that experience is. That's what I want to talk about. Um, and that's what we get our, you know, um, almost 100 reviewers who review for Audiophile to do. Let's say a book is a, a commonly well-respected author writes a book that's maybe not her best. Let's say that. Okay. It's considered the worst of her lot. But the performance or the, the audio is a fantastic, let's say, a full cast kind of performance. That would get a really good review in your magazine where it might not get a great book review in the New York Times. Is that how it, it right. works? Right. It probably would. It would probably say, you know, the performance saved this less than stellar, you know, entry in a series. I mean, especially sometimes in long running series, they're not always you know, the very best one, the latest one is not the very best one, you know, um, and it, that's uh, something that a, a skilled narrator can do. They can make the most of what's there <laughs> to make the experience good. Um, and so even though, I mean, I'm thinking of mysteries sometimes are a little disappointing, but if the narrator has done a wonderful job with characters Mm -hmm. then you enjoy those characters, even though the plot maybe was a little disappointing or you figured it out before the end. You know, some any of the things that sometimes um, in in print, in a print review might be called out as, um, you know, not the best example of the author's work. But it can also go the other way <laughs> because the, the narrators can wreck it. Yes. <laughs> Oh, we're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, as far as genre goes, do you have any personal preferences in terms of genre or are you very democratized? <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I do. I personally have uh, favorites. I uh, love to listen to a lot of um, audiobooks in various mystery, thriller, suspense categories. Um, but one of the things that, uh, so that would be my first choice, probably off the top. Um, but one of the things that, uh, I've done in the last couple of years is, is we have a podcast called behind the mic with audio file magazine. And we talk about one audio book each day for like five minutes, very short, little tiny book talk. And, um, there are four of us that share the, um, the, uh, uh, it's, well, we have a host. So the guest, we are the guests, um, okay. on the, on the podcast. So every month, um, uh, I have a week of doing four, five little episodes on audiobooks, and I have to pick my pick my own five. So instead of just having Robin's week is always mysteries, <laughs> I think, you know, I have tried very hard to um, pick other things that interest me in general, but I might not pick them 
as my very first as as my listening choice. And a lot of them I've found are are nonfiction. And I think one of the things about audiobooks is and uh, is that you can you really can love the one you're with if it's a good performance. And sometimes I will listen to a narrator who I really like, not particularly interested in the topic, but I love the way they tell a story. And then they surprise me because they're, you know, if the story is good and it does, you know, pan out as being as interesting as I thought it, you know, uh, it's a surprise. Um, And, you know, sometimes you, um, I've judged in a, lot of competitions and you don't get to choose what you're listening to. And again, I have been surprised that the really good stuff might not be something I was ever pick up. And yet here I was, I'm fascinated. I'm carried away with it. So, you know, um, although I have uh, personal favorites, probably, I also, you know, try to stay open and I love to be surprised. Are there any things that will turn you off to a book that, that make you immediately when you are hearing it in an audio version, are there narration, maybe ticks that make you go, nope, I can't yeah. sit through this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, there probably there are a lot, actually, probably, because I have a very high standard for what I consider great narration. But one thing I can just write off the top is um, uh, basically screechy children's voices. You know, when there's children talking, it uh, to me, it completely plays uh, down. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you, the narrator is is talking down to the child by trying to imitate a, t- a tiny little tinny voice. That's not necessary for the children and is extremely irritating to <laughs> adults. <laughs> I think it's if you notice too much that the narrator is, oh, now he's in his man voice and now he's in his, you know, it shouldn't, you shouldn't even register that. Yeah. Um, and I think there's another thing that's interesting along those lines, which is sometimes happens with celebrities. If you are noticing that celebrity's voice, then you are out of that story. And it takes, and particularly with uh, with celebrity narrators whose voices are well, very well known, we really they have to kind of tamp it down. They have to get, work harder to get it into the story and to keep us in the story, so we don't keep remembering that you know it's Tom Hanks <laughs> reading to me. Right. Uh, that he's he's not there as Tom Hanks. He's in that story. And we shouldn't really think of keep thinking about him <laughs> because he should be the character. Are there any celebrities that you think really can nail it that um, have done a great version of oh. audiobooks before? Oh, I, th- I think there are. Um, and, you know, uh, Kate Winslet is a great example. She's done a few audiobooks. She can be the kind of chameleon in the acting world where she can become whatever character she wants. And you just don't even n- notice um, yes. that who it is. You're you're so in inside the story. I think I think one of the things that's good about celebrities, because I'm a bit 50-50, depends on what what they're, you know, what they're doing. It's great for marketing because it brings people who otherwise might not think about an audiobook to the format. And then hopefully that celebrity has done a great job and they're, they think, oh, this is great. I like audiobooks. So from that point of view, I have to be positive about it. Although I have to say it isn't always a success. Whether they read a book a day or a book a year, I love asking people to tell me about their favorite books. And that includes you, dear listener. What's your all-time favorite? Your desert island classic? What about the childhood favorite that you still know by heart? The mystery that took you by surprise? 
the biography that changed your way of thinking, or the book club favorite that you can't stop thinking about. I'm looking for guests from all walks of life to talk to me about all kinds of books here on the show. Go to my website, juliewroteabook.com, and click on the button that says, Be a Guest on the Best Book Ever. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Now, back to the show. So you mentioned um, actors doing children's voices, which leads me automatically to think about what we're talking about today, The Golden Compass. Yes. Which I took your advice and I listened to on audio um, instead of reading it on paper. Um, First of all, do you remember how you first came across this novel? Um, I I think I do. It was a while ago. (laughs) So we're 20 plus years here. But um, uh, at the time, Audiophile was being published. Um, We had about maybe 10 years, um, not maybe not quite 10 years. And um, I have a friend um, who was um, the uh, head of Listening Library which is now part of Random House. Uh, But he and I used the publisher, used to talk about audiobooks that he was producing. I mean, he produced uh, Judy Bloom's, all of Judy Bloom's uh, original audiobooks and many very, you know, just an exceptional pioneer in um, children's audiobooks and relationships with the authors and getting authors excited about children's audiobooks. So um, his name is Tim Tim Ditlow. And he told me about a project that he was collaborating with, um, with Bruce Covell, the auth- children's author, um, and uh, with an English author that I'd never heard of named Philip Pullman. And wow. uh, he said, this is really going to be exceptional. We're going to do this with a full cast. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And he said, but we're going to do it not the way most full cast was done at the time and the way most full cast is done now, which is with um, a script, an adapted script. Um, He said, we're going to do it unabridged word for word. And I said, wow, that's quite a project there. you You know, how many how many in the cast, how, you know, anyway, so I, I heard about that before it happened. And then when it came out, um, I, you know, I got to listen to it. Uh, I knew about it. Um, and I met Philip Pullman, um, and this whole, the whole relationship with many parts of this came to life. The people who produced it in the UK, um, where it was produced, as I say, differently uh, with multiple actors. The every it was, um, I guess, what we would say is highly edited. It was done like a film. That is a highly complicated <laughs> process and a very expensive process. And I'm not sure they've ever sort of replicated it. Um, and I mean, that's to some extent why. Uh, all the people that were involved, all the care that was taken with casting and editing, everything has made it come out as such an exceptional audiobook that is a you know a high standard for any kind of multi-voice performance. Do you happen to know um, were the ch- were the actors playing the child characters? Were they children no. at the time? No, they were adults. No, they were. And it worked perfectly because they weren't trying to sound like children. No. Yeah. No. Uh, No, they were young, I think. Some, uh, but not that young. I mean, not teenagers. Mm -hmm. They were all adult actors. Yeah. And I think there was a, you know, there was always a director. This is another thing. The whole thing was very carefully directed. Um, They, you know, I don't think they actually rehearsed it, but they did many, you know, retakes uh, because it, the actors were often in the same room. That's something else that doesn't always happen now. You know, the California actor records their, their paragraphs and the New York actor (laughs) 
<laughs> records that those paragraphs and then it's edited together. They never see each other. They never actually interact. This was not done that way. These actors were in the same studio when the it was recorded. Will you tell my listeners what this book is about? In 10 words or less? In 10 words or less. <laughs> go. You have 30 seconds. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. So The Golden Compass is the story of uh, a, a young girl, Lyra Bellacqua, who uh, basically comes of age um, in a world that is familiar and unfamiliar. Um, this is a fantasy. Um, so she's in a world that is very much like contemporary Oxford colleges or, you know, sometime past, not too far past, a real world. Um, but she discovers that there actually are other worlds, other alternate universes. Uh, and she can move between the, uh, the worlds. Um, and it's a long saga three books in the original um his dark materials is the is the name of the first trilogy um and the golden compass is the first one now philip pullman has uh written a sequel of at least two and there may be more books in called the book of dust so it's uh you know it's he's he's created a universe um multiple universes, multiple worlds in which there are creatures of all kinds. And I think that's one of the great appeals of uh, Phillips, these, these, his dark materials uh, series and the golden compass in particular, um, the demons, which are the animal spirits that each uh, person has. Um, and there are witches. Uh, there are creatures of all kinds. Uh, and they're uh, fascinating characters and lots of steampunk. Have you ever read it, first of all, on paper? What an interesting question. I don't think I have read it um, on paper. So my only experience is, uh, yes, in, in audio. And then I've seen the two film adaptions. Oh, there are two. Mm. There's a feature film called The Golden Compass, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, and then there's the HBO series called His Dark Materials, which is just out last year. The reason I ask if you've ever read it on audio or on paper is because I was enthralled by this book. I almost never read fantasy. And as I was listening to this, I was thinking, am I in love with this book because it is such an incredible audio production? or because it's such an incredible book. I think it's both. The story is highly emotional on yes. so many different levels. And I think that's one of the things that the, um, the actors were able to just bring alive in a way that not all readers would get. Um, because, I mean, they bring out that powerful connection between Lyra and Will or, you know, the friendship uh, of any of the characters in the story, you know, and also the kind of the suspense, the danger, the involvement that the, the communities within this world, these worlds have is beautifully conveyed um, in the audio book versions. But one of the things that I think in the Nicole Kidman uh, uh, film is they just missed that. I don't I don't know. I don't know what exactly. I mean, there was a lot of controversy over the film, but there was just they they really missed bringing out what Philip obviously has in this story. And what is captured in the audiobook about the connection of the characters and these great emotional um, and philosophical, uh, you know, ideas and and thoughts that are going through it that we're they're struggling with. We're struggling with <clears throat> trying to resolve. 
it's a wonderful story that children can enjoy because of the animals. They don't have to get into all the deeper levels of the philosophy yeah. and, and conflicts. I mean, I think that's what Philip is so brilliant at because in the tradition of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and some of the great British fantasy writers, he's made many stories on many levels of what's going on. And, and yet it is, I mean, it was uh, sold first in this country as a children's book. And then it was actually rep- republished or rebranded so that it they they could make, you know, bring it to a a, a bigger uh, um, audience that had you know didn't have any kind of an age restriction on it. I listened with my son when he was in middle school, and we can still he's now thirty five. We can still talk about the different about Lyra and Pantalaimon. Uh, her demon. And the fact that not only do you have this demon who's your spirit animal and your conscience and your soul, but you talk to them and they talk back. That is something that very, that's a very clever trick in uh, the audio because the demons were different actors. In print, what would you make of that? I'm now I'm going to go try to figure it out because you might hear the same voice talking. If you're speaking, Lyra is speaking to Pandalimon and Pandalimon is speaking back. Yeah, yeah. Do we hear the same thing? But in the audio, you don't. You have two separate uh, voices. Now, have have you listened to the entire series on audio? Of the books, yes. You yes. have. Yeah. And do they all hold up to the first one? I think so. I mean, it's um, uh, essentially the same casts. There are some changes because they were done over a couple of years because obviously Philip didn't write them all at once. And there were a few changes, but essentially they were the same. You know, there are parts of uh, the Golden Compass that will always be my favorites. We haven't talked about um, Yorick Berenson, the bear. <laughs> Who is my favorite? Well, pretty yes. much my favorite character. If if you were to have told me there's a talking bear, I would have thought, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree, absolute favorite character. So well done, yep. so beautifully acted. It gives me chills to even talk about it again. But I love that Sean Barrett did the the voice for Yorick. And he's one of my favorite actors. He still does audiobooks because um, a lot of these uh, these actors in that uh, original productions are still recording audiobooks. And then they did. Um, I did look this up because I, I was trying to remember if this is right. But one of the things that they did was because the actors were actually in the studio together, they took out with Philip's permission, the he said, she said. I mean, that was a big deal then. It was, and I think it really um, helped to make the connection that the, the that the narrators have and that, that Philip wrote there. Um, and we also, I think we should talk a little bit about how amazing Philip was as the overall narrator, because He's yes. not an actor. He's a writer. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a, and he taught. So he was a professor. So he can talk to people, but he had not been in front of a microphone. Um, and, you know, the, the, his success as the storyteller narrator within the story is, is really astonishing. Um, and to me, ranks within the very best. I mean, there are only a handful of authors that I can say are really at the top, the very top choice for narrators of their own work. Tell me um, some of the other authors that you think can do it, because that's, that's one oh. for me, too, is authors okay. <laughs> very often, I think, gosh. Well, you're going to guess this one, but Neil Gaiman. Oh, of course. <laughs> is yeah. right up there. Um, and, you know, he he is spectacular. And um, 
I actually just discovered a, another uh, author, narrator. I mean, I can think of others, but we're sort of in the same slightly fantastic <laughs> world. Um, and that is Morris Gleitzman, who is an Australian children's author, very celebrated and well-known, um, should be better known in the U.S., quite spectacular uh, writer. He has a series that is just the seventh of it has just come out um, in in a long, I mean, I think it oh, more than a decade uh, he's taken to write this. But there's something about capturing capturing the narrative in a way and putting putting you in the story. I mean that 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 doesn't really sound very special, but when when you hear it, you know. Robin, tell me what are you reading right now. Ah, well, I actually, I, because I, that's why I introduced Morris Gleitzman, because I just finished his new uh, book, which is called Always. And I'm very excited about it. Um, I, as I say, I've listened to a lot of mysteries, I've listened to Louise Penny's Madness of Crowds, which I was excited about. Um, I've listened to a new multicast uh, Agatha Christie uh, mm. story with Alfred Molina, who's one of my favorite uh, audiobook narrators. Who's going to be Inspector Gamache. Did you know that? No. Yes, they're making a TV show. She finally approved it. It's a series produced by the people who produced The Crown, and Alfred Molina is going to be Gamache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be still my heart. Oh, how interesting. Well, that will be a treat. Um, but, you know, so I listen to a lot of things, but I am very, I just finished the Always book by Morris Gleitzman. And um, in the same vein with Philip Pullman and the Golden Compass, this is a powerful, very interesting story that I think transcends the intended audience, which is teens. But for adults, it's a, a very powerful and affecting uh, story and performance. It's one of those, it's the seven, you know, it's the seventh in this series of this long story. So we're at the end and I'm like, I have to go back. I have to know <laughs> everything. I got to start at number one, go back and find out this full backstory of what happened. Will you tell my listeners where they can find you and audiophile and get access to all of this wonderful information? Yes. Uh, audiophilemagazine.com is our website. Um, you can browse, find recommendations uh, for thousands of audiobooks. Uh, we put up new uh, recommendations every week. Um, we also, from there, the, our podcast, Behind the Mic with Audiophile Magazine, is uh, you can get it from our website or Apple Podcasts, anywhere, anywhere you can get your podcast. Um, and we also have another podcast that is a little bit different. It's called Audiobook Break, and it is a serialized audiobook. So it's an audiobook that has been taken into chapters and released in episodes. Um, and the, the book that we're doing right now is The Iliad. So it's the original chapters. It's a, an audio book that uh, was uh, produced uh, a number of years ago. The narrator is Anton Lesser, who is a wonderful British actor. Um, and this is, is serialized, one, uh, two, two chapters uh, a week. But you can listen to the whole thing. You can start at the beginning. You can, the, and so it's, um, it's the idea is, Originally, stories were serialized. David Copperfield was the first one mm -hmm. we did. It was originally released, you know, as uh, one, one chapter at a time. I, we thought it would be a great idea to try that with some of the brilliant audiobooks that have been done and see what podcast listeners think of this sort of short format. But it's taking, a, it's taking the format of a podcast in the sense of the length, and kind of putting it together how you ac access an audiobook when maybe 10 hours sounds like too, mu too much listening. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Robin, I want to thank you for joining me today. This has been so lovely talking to you and about one of my favorite subjects, audiobooks. And I hope you will come back anytime you have a book you want to talk to me about. I would love to, Julie. This has been very fun. Had a lovely conversation. Thanks. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie wrote a book. If you loved this episode as much as I loved making it, why not leave a review wherever you're listening? Each review helps new listeners find my work, and I'm so grateful for your help. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.